Good evening. Welcome to the 2018 Talk of the Town series sponsored by the Sandwich Cultural Council and the Sandwich Glass Museum. I'm Katie Campbell, the Executive Director. We are pleased to welcome back Christopher Daly as he explores Irish Need Not Apply. Mr. Daly has been lecturing over New England for over 25 years on historical topics of interest. He is currently a history teacher at the Silver Lake Regional School System in Kingston, Mass. He holds a BA and an MA from Bridgewater State University in political science and history. Mr. Daly has written several articles on very historical topics, and he has written his first book entitled Murder and Mayhem in Boston, Historic Crimes in the Hub. <laughs> Mr. Daly has also served as historical consultant and appeared on such programs as the Travel Channel's Time Traveling with Brian Unger and the Learning Channel's Kindred Spirits. Mr. Daly resides in Wareham, Mass. by Buzzers Bay with his wife Kathy, their two dogs Grady and Lincoln, and three cats Bo, Chloe, and Penelope. <laughs> Welcome, Mr. Daly. <laughs> Good evening. Show of hands, how many people have a little Irish in them? Oh, how did I know that was going to happen? Well, uh, as you can tell probably from the name, uh, I have a little Irish in me. Uh, as far as I can tell from my genealogy, it's 100%. Well, we haven't taken the little DNA test yet, so we don't know. Uh, and my family came over in the 1850s, just after the potato famine. And as far as I can tell, Irish Catholic, Irish Catholic, Irish Catholic. And that's probably where I got interested in this subject, the history of the Irish. And uh, as, as you heard from my bio, I've been lecturing on different topics for years and years. And I thought, hmm, this would be a great topic. And I started to delve into it thinking that maybe we should do a, a lecture on the Irish in America. But I didn't think you'd want to be here for two weeks. So we got it down to the Irish in Massachusetts. You wouldn't want to be here for two days. So it's gotten down to Boston. And the reason I picked Boston was this was a major hub of immigration for the Irish. St. John's, New Brunswick, New York City, Philadelphia were other spots as well. And in, the further I got into my research, the more astounded I became at what I found, the things I dug up are amazing, shocking in some instances. And I uh, developed this lecture a few years ago and I've been delivering it usually around, uh, guess what holiday? <laughs> yes, St. Patrick's Day. So it's nice to give it in May for a change. So without any further ado, we'll get going here. Uh, little little uh, request here, if you have any comments or questions, we'll have a little Q&A at the end. And uh, if, if there are none, we'll, we'll just pack it up for the evening. But hopefully there'll be some questions at the end. Thank you. Well, contrary to popular belief, the Irish were not the first in Boston. It was the Puritans. Now, this, this goes to my deficit in uh, public school education. When I, when I went to school, I learned the Puritans came to America seeking religious freedom. And that was it. Freedom from who? From what? What religion? These, these answers came eventually as I got older and did my own studying. And basically the Puritans, this is the, the short story of the Puritans. The Puritans came here because of this gentleman. And I think you all know him. That's Henry VIII. 
He is the king, as you know, who broke away from the Catholic Church because he wanted a divorce, essentially, in a nutshell. Now, during this time, we had the Protestant Reformation, and there were people leaving the Catholic Church for more spiritual reasons than to get a divorce. And the Puritans saw the Anglican Church, which was the Church of England, with Henry at the head, as somewhat of a stand-in for the Catholic Church. If you were to go into an Anglican Church today, even you, you might think that you were in a Catholic Church. These Puritans wanted to purify it. They wanted to change this church into a true Protestant church. And this is the man that they followed. This is John Calvin. He was a philosopher, a theologian, and his, his theology was that true Christians should only do what is in the Bible. Not what the Pope says, not what councils say, only what's in the Bible. And he wanted to bring Christianity back to what the first century Christians were like, those first people who knew Jesus, who followed him. In that first century, all they did was they followed what were the teachings of the gospel. The Bible hadn't really been written yet. It was the gospel that they followed. And they wanted to strip down this church. They wanted to create a more pure church, to purify the church. And that's what they, that was their philosophy, these people that came to Boston. Here's, here's a bit of a difference. You saw that church I just showed you? This is a Puritan church. Do you see any crosses, statues? Uh, if you saw one of, one of the ministers, he would not have the vestments, the Roman vestments, anything like that. It's purified of all that. These are the people that were in Boston. These are the people that came and settled. This is what it looked like. That immigration in 1630, there were 30 ships of Puritans that came in, and eventually they, they ended up on this tiny little peninsula that was called Shawmut by the Indians. At high tide, it was, a, it was an island. This is the Boston they came to. This was the city that they proclaimed was going to be their, their shining city on a hill. And this is probably what it looked like in those days. That's Beacon Hill before it was cut down. That's the beacon. Just to give you a little orientation, if you were standing on State Street today and looking towards the State House, that's probably what you would see. And they wanted to create this new Jerusalem where Christianity could be reborn and, and live the way it was supposed to be. And they lived their law according to the Bible. Their law was based on Leviticus, the Old Testament. And we've all heard about the Scarlet Letter and all that. That's how they governed. That's how they had Boston. And into this came the Irish. The first Irish were not far behind those Puritans. The thing is, the first Irish did not come here of their own choice. They were brought here. Here's a nice little term. They were called indentured servants. Now, back to my public education when I learned uh, an indentured servant is somebody who is willing to come to America. And usually the situation is that they don't have enough money to come here. They find somebody who is already established here who is willing to pay their passage. And for a period of five to seven years, they will serve them. Hopefully they'll learn a trade. After that time, they're free. This was not the case with the Irish. They were forced to come here. And it was all because of this gentleman. This is Oliver Cromwell. Now, I haven't mentioned this up to this point, but there was a civil war in England between the Puritans, who wanted to purify the church, and the Royalists, who were Anglicans. Henry, Henry VIII's uh, successors. And in that war, the Puritans won. And this man was the head of their army. He became the head of the government once they won. They took the king and they executed him. Charles I was executed. He took the place of king, but he refused to take the title. His title was Lord Protector of the Commonwealth of England. Now, shortly after he took control, he started hearing these stories coming back from Ireland 
of atrocities being committed against Englishmen, occupiers of, of Ireland. Now, uh, the English had been involved in Ireland going all the way back to William the Conqueror. And he was hearing these stories of atrocities, these people, these Irish, attacking these English and maiming them and torturing them, all sorts of horrible things, which now in hindsight we know were, this was the original fake news. Uh, this was not true, but this is what Cromwell heard, and he decided he was going to take his new model army, as it was called, go to Ireland and teach these people a lesson. He did that. First, he turned his army on the city of Drogheda. Now, Drogheda was an old, walled, medieval city. His army surrounded the city, and they demanded from the mayor that they surrender. And you know what the mayor told them to do? Go take a flying leap, in other words, to paraphrase. And Cromwell said, if you do not surrender, there will be no quarter, no mercy. There was a, there was a, a, a siege, and finally they breached the walls of Drogheda. They got in, and they killed as many soldiers as they could get their hands on. Now, these, these numbers that you see here are not soldiers. These are citizens that were killed in that siege. He continued. He went to... The next place he went to was Wexford. Same situations, uh, 1,500 killed in this siege. As you notice, the, the numbers are going down because they've heard what has gone on in the previous place. By the time he got to Waterford, Ireland was on her knees. They were at his mercy. He had subjugated the island once again. Now, this seems that it was not enough for Cromwell just to uh, militarily subjugate the island. He wanted to clear the island, and this is how he did it. This is where the indentured servant title comes from. In the 1650s, over 100,000 Irish children were taken from the arms of their parents and sent to the colonies as indentured servants. Also, we find Thousands of men and women were abducted and sold as indentured servants in the America. So this is, this is a mass kidnapping of people brought to the, the Americas. Not only, not only New England, but we're talking about down in the Caribbean, Virginia, all of England's colonies. And this is how the Irish first came to Boston. And I've, I've read the documents, signing over so many indentured servants, bringing these children over. And, and adults as servants. This is how the first Irish came to Boston. And as you can imagine, this might be a scene uh, from Boston when these first Irishmen got off the ship and here's their Puritan master ready to dole them out to what family they were assigned. And you know what the first thing that many of these Irish did once they touched shore? They ran away. And this is, this is quite an interesting fact here. I found an old runaway slave ad. And if you look very closely, the top one talks about a Negro fellow. On the same page is a runaway Irishman. In many cases, the Africans would run away with the Irish. They'd help each other. But in um, most cases, the, the Africans would be caught and brought back by the simple fact of the color of their skin. Now, the Irishman could slip into the population as long as he kept his mouth shut. Once he started talking in that Gaelic, they knew what he was. But he could slip into the population very easily, get into a major city, and disappear. And this was the case. But if you got caught and you were brought back, this is probably what you would suffer. You would be put in the pillory or the stocks. This is just one thing they would do. Now, now, that looks very nice. You might get a suntan. You just sit out there, a nice day, just enjoy yourself. No, it was not like that. Most times, uh, the populace would come out with every rotten thing they could find, from garbage to animal feces, whatnot, and stand there and throw it in your face for the entire day whilst mocking you. This was the punishment for escaping indentured servants. And if you did it again, you might be forced to be whipped at the cart's tail. This was a very nice punishment. You'd be uh, dragged through town and whipped on the back of a cart's tail like this gentleman here. 
Now in Boston, all these punishments took place at the townhouse, as they called it. You can see where the, there's somebody being whipped here, somebody in the pillory. And just to familiarize you to where this location is, I'm going to show you the exact location today. Let's look at that. Do you recognize that? That is where the townhouse used to be. Now it's just known for the Boston Massacre, but you never hear about the people that were whipped and put into the pillories here. Now, let's talk about the Scots-Irish. Now, here's my, here's my poor public education again. I thought, so Scots-Irish, who are these Scots-Irish? Are they just Irish people who like to drink scotch or something? Or who are these people? Well, the Scots-Irish were actually Presbyterians. Presbyterians are also Calvinists. So religiously, they are very connected to the Puritans. So in the period when Cromwell was in charge, they were in with Cromwell. And what Cromwell wanted to do was to get people to colonize Ireland that were of the Calvinist bent. Presbyterians were perfect. They needed land. They had land in Ireland, and they moved from Scotland to Ireland. <clears throat> Within a few generations, they were more Irish than Scottish. And after a while, the Puritans fell out with the populace of England. I, I think it's because they didn't like to have fun. Because they, they, they banned theater, they banned bear baiting. Have you ever heard of bear baiting? It's a nice sport. You tie a bear to a, a pole and you just taunt, taunt him. That was something that the English liked to do. The, the Puritans banned that. They banned Christmas or, or games, all those things. So eventually they got rid of the Puritans and they brought back the king. Uh, problem was he didn't have a head. So they brought back the next best thing, Charles II, his son. So now the Puritans are on the outs. So are the Presbyterians. And they passed something in 1704 called the Sacramental Test Act. This basically said if you, weren't not, if you were not an Anglican minister, <coughs> you could not preach anywhere within what is now the United Kingdom. So many of these Scots-Irish decided that they would go to America, where the Puritans still held sway. Back here in New England, they were still in control. And they came here at the behest of some of the more famous Puritans. This is uh, Cotton Mather. You may recognize him from the Salem Witch Trials. <coughs> he had a correspondence with these uh, Protestant uh, Pur Presbyterians. And if you read his letters, he's, he's very enticing. Come on over. We are brethren. We're Calvinists. When they got here, they found out it was a, quite a different story. When they got here, the Puritans wanted to ship them out to the frontier, New Hampshire, Maine, Western Massachusetts, as sort of a buffer between the Puritans and the Indians. Some of them did stay in Boston. They formed a church. <coughs> and if you look here, this, is, this gives you an idea of what the Puritans thought of the Presbyterians. This is what they called their church. The Church of the Presbyterian Strangers. So when you look at this, sure, they were connected religiously, but they were still Scottish. They were still Irish. So therefore, they were not up to, up to snuff. Now, just to show you where this is in Boston, this might be a, a location that you recognize. <clears throat> the church is no longer there. Anybody recognize this building? This is 100 Federal Street, and I couldn't fit the whole thing in, so I did this. This is, um, I believe, the State Street Bank. <clears throat> this is where the Church of the Presbyterian Strangers was. The congregation still exists. However, it's moved. It is the Congregational Church over on Arlington Street on the corner of the Common there. So that congregation still exists today. That's how we got the Scots-Irish. And believe it or not, did you know John F. Kennedy was not the first Irish president? It was Andrew Jackson. He was Scots-Irish. 
and the struggle begins. Even though we have a small population of Irish, <clears throat> we start seeing trouble happen. In 1647, there was a rumor that there was a Jesuit priest in Boston. Now, we don't know if there was a Jesuit priest. You, you wonder if there was a small group of Catholic Irish. There were also some French. <clears throat> um, how were they, how were they getting their sacraments? How were they getting their religious ceremonies? Maybe there was a Jesuit priest kind of preaching underground. We have not found any documentation, but there was a rumor going around amongst the Puritans that there was a Jesuit priest. And this law arose of this. Let me give you the actual wording here. Death to all and every Jesuit seminary priest, missionary, or other spiritual ecclesiastical person made or ordained by any authority, power, jurisdiction, derived, challenged, pretended from the Pope or the See of Rome. Whew. Translation, no Catholics. If you can't have priests, you can't have Catholics. So basically, this was an anti-Catholic law. The Irish Catholics, if they were worshipping, they had to do it underground or they would suffer this penalty. This is the beginning. And there's just a small group of Catholics, Irish Catholics in Boston at this time. And then comes a woman who is uh, actually referred to as the first uh, Irish martyr. Her name was Anne Glover. She was an elderly woman, <clears throat> referred to as Goodwife Glover. Now the story is that she was brought over as an indentured servant, brought to the Caribbean with her, her husband, who it said that he was put to death because he refused to renounce his religion. She ended up being brought up here. She had uh, girls, she had a, a few girls with her, her daughters, and they worked for this John Goodwin in Boston as laundresses, as maids. Now, an issue arose <clears throat> where the daughters of John Goodwin uh, accused the daughters of Goodwife Glover of stealing laundry which she denied. And then good wife Ann Glover came into the picture and a big fight erupted. After this, the daughters of John Goodwin started to become sick. And they claimed that good wife Glover had put a spell on them. Does this sound familiar? I think this is the prototype for Salem. Well, good wife Glover was brought in. She was put on trial before the magistrates. And she was accused of being a witch. <clears throat> now, when you're accused of being a witch, there are several tests that they give you to determine if you're a witch. And they would refer to this book. This is a book uh, written by Cotton Mather himself. How to identify a witch. There's, there's very many, many things you can do to identify where the witch. I can't get into it right now. One thing, the, probably the first thing that they do is that they believe that a witch could not recite the Lord's Prayer. So they asked good wife, good wife Glover to take the stand and recite the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father. She began to do it, but she did it in Latin. That was not reciting the Lord's Prayer. Technically, she could not recite the Lord's Prayer. It was in Latin. They did not accept this, and they put her to death as a witch right out on Boston Common. <clears throat> now, oddly enough, uh, several years ago, I was in the north end of Boston, which now we know as the, the Little Italy of Boston. And there's a little, there was a little Irish restaurant there, believe it or not, called Good Wife Glovers or Goody Glovers. And they had this plaque on the wall, and they, they refer to her as Boston's first Irish martyr. And they have a little, uh, or did have, I think they've gone out of business since, had a little uh, picture of what she might have looked like. Just a simple older lady and uh, put to death for her religion. Well, let's go back to England, huh? Jolly old England. Well, did you know that they have a holiday just like we do on the 4th of July where they have fireworks? It's on November 5th, and it celebrates the gunpowder plot. How many people have ever heard of this, the gunpowder plot? Yeah. Yeah. What happened was this uh, group of Catholics, I guess you could call them Catholic terrorists, had somehow gotten into the basement of Parliament, 
and they brought barrels of gunpowder in. The, pl the plan was when Parliament was in session, they would light those gunpowder kegs up and blow Parliament sky high. The plot was foiled. And they celebrate it today because it was foiled. And it's actually called, maybe you've heard of this, it's called Guy Fawkes Day. This is Guy Fawkes. He was guarding the gunpowder on November 5th, and he was found out. They caught him. They arrested him. And they brought him to the Tower of London. And you know what they do to people in the Tower of London. He was tortured. And pretty soon he gave up all of his Confederates. There was a whole bunch of them. <clears throat> they were quickly tried and they were convicted of treason. Now this treason, if you, if you were going to be convicted of anything in Old England, you did not want to be convicted of treason. This was the worst thing you could possibly do in England because the punishment was so severe that I believe our Eighth Amendment to the Constitution against cruel and unusual punishment is based on this. This is what would happen to you. You would be <laughs> drawn, hanged, and quartered. These gentlemen. First, you were drawn from jail in a cart. Sometimes you would just be drawn on your back to the scaffold, and then you would have the noose placed around your neck they would haul you up, strangling, and then let you down just before you strangled to death, tie you to a table, slit you from stem to stern, and start to pull out your innards. In some cases, people were still conscious. This isn't it either. The final, the piece de resistance of this was you would be quartered. And this is what they did. They would take the victim and tie each limb to a separate horse and have them run in a different direction. And then the head would be placed on London Bridge as a, as a warning. Now, each of his confederates, Guy Fawkes' confederates, had to go up and he witnessed this happen to each of them individually. He knew what was in store for him. He took the scaffold, he was in irons, but he saw a big rock down below and he took a leap and smashed his head on a rock and cheated the executioner. Now you might be wondering, what does this have to do with Irish in Boston? This is what it has to do. This, this holiday is celebrated not only in England, but it was brought over to Boston. In Boston, it wasn't called Guy Fawkes Day, however. It was called Pope's Day. And it was celebrated in the streets of Boston. This is how it went over here. Each neighborhood had its own gang, so to say, and they'd make an effigy of the Pope. And on Guy Fawkes Day or Pope's Day, they'd take their effigy and they'd go into all the other neighborhoods and try to defend their effigy of the Pope while the other neighborhood tried to tear it apart. Now, at the end of the day, the gang or the neighborhood with the effigy of the Pope that was still in one piece won the day. And there was lots of drinking and carousing. Now, this went on until the Revolutionary War, believe it or not. This, this was put to an end just after Boston was liberated by cannons on Dorchester Heights by a man, man by the name of Henry Knox. Do you know what his background was? Irish, Scots-Irish. And the man that put an end to this, there's a statue uh, commemorating him in uh, the gardens here over by uh, the uh, frog pond. That is George Washington. He saw this. He knew that there were many Irish fighting him in his army, and he put a stop to this. He thought this was absolutely and totally disrespectful. This is the Boston that the first Irish came to. And then after a while, after these, these tumultuous things, the Irish begin to emerge. That Some time has passed and they come out of the shadow, so to say. Here are some firsts here. The first Irish Catholic mass was held here. It was held at the corner of Washington and School Streets. Actually, the Irish Famine Memorial is right here, if you're familiar with that. And I believe the church was right over here. It was an old barn that Huguenots had used in the past. They abandoned it. The Catholics took it over and had the first mass in Boston, 1788. This was the first Irish Catholic 
just Catholic mass in all of New England, believe it or not. <clears throat> the first cathedral built in Boston, it, they didn't build a cathedral until 1803. And the location is over on 49 Franklin Street. There's a plaque on the wall there. Uh, up until recently, this was still owned by the Catholic Church, but today I uh, hear that it is a restaurant called Bon Pita, if you would like to go and check out their fare. And the first burial ground was St. Augustine's in Dorchester. Um, I'm sorry, South Boston, Dorchester Street. Uh, this wasn't uh, consecrated until 1818, which begs the question, where did the Irish bury their dead? Where did the Catholics bury their dead? We found evidence of Irish Catholic burials in paupers' graves. My thinking is probably they brought over a, a priest, probably sprinkled some holy water on the ground, and that was consecration enough. But there was nowhere to put them until 1818. They tried to put a, a burial ground in, uh, I think, Charlestown, and the city wouldn't allow it. They told them to go someplace else. In the first Irish Catholic newspaper, they start communicating the Boston pilot. It still exists today. Now, the immigration actually begins as a trickle. Uh, if, you, if you went on the street today, I think if you asked uh, the common person on the street, man on the street, when did the Irish first start coming over, they might give you an answer like, um, uh, I think it had something to do with potatoes in, I don't know, 1920s or something like that, potatoes. Many of you might think that the, the first Irish came over as a result of the potato famine in the 1840s. Actually, it started much earlier. It started in the 1820s as a trickle. And it started because of these laws. These laws were imposed by the British government on Ireland, on the citizens of Ireland, specifically the Catholic Irish. Uh, just to read you a few, Irish Catholic was forbidden to exercise his religion, forbidden to receive an education, to enter a profession, to hold public office, to engage in trade or commerce. Further on down here, forbidden to vote, you couldn't be guardian to your own child. You couldn't attend Catholic worship. You could not educate your child, your own child. And uh, you couldn't even own a horse greater value than five pounds. What they're doing here is essentially stripping away the human rights of the Irish Catholics in Ireland. Now, additionally, they passed these laws. These are called the Enclosure Acts. <clears throat> this is kind of just a paraphrase of what they all did. Uh, essentially, if you were Irish Catholic and you still own land and it hadn't been taken from you, you couldn't plant on it, you couldn't harvest any lumber from it, you couldn't uh, graze animals, anything. You could do one thing, though. You could sell it to an Englishman. And that's what a lot of the Irish did. <clears throat> they saw the writing on the wall and they got out. They sold their land and they came to America. Now, these people had some money. And they were the first Irish to come into Boston, uh, other than the indentured servant. And just to give you an idea of the influx in those early days, <clears throat> the population of um, Boston grew, uh, the Irish population was 2,000 in 1820. And five years later, it had grown to 5,000. By 1830, they had 7,000. Now, to give you a little perspective here, the entire population was only 60,000. So 7,000 Irish in this city is, is a small but large nut of people here. And what we see is we start to see problems arising because of all these Irish arriving. <clears throat> Wait to the famine. Here are some early conflicts that happened, even in those early days, before the potato famine, before the deluge of immigrants. Um, this is one of note. This is the Ursuline Convent, which was in Charlestown, just over the river. I know it's not Boston, but it's so close. You could see it from Boston. This location is now Somerville, in case you want to go and visit the site. Uh, this was a convent of Catholic nuns. 
and their mission was education. <clears throat> now, these nuns educated young ladies. Oddly enough, the young ladies that attended school here were of Yankee stock. The old Puritan descendants were sent to the school because they learned the classics, they learned music, they learned all, all the reasonable things to be a lady. And this is the situation. Now, something happened here. This is Rebecca Reed. She was brought into the convent as a student on a scholarship. She was of Yankee stock, but it seems that her family didn't have any money. She was brought in as a student. And as far as we know, she was doing okay. She actually applied to be a novice. That's somebody that wants to convert to Catholicism and eventually become a nun. <clears throat> and then for some reason, she just left and wrote this manuscript which is called Six Months in a Convent. In it, she says that these girls were terribly tortured, that they were brainwashed into wanting to make them into Catholic nuns. All these heinous things, these things that were all uh, said about what was going on in this convent, which now we know in hindsight through study that none of it was true. We, uh, we don't know why she wrote this. Maybe she needed some money and wanted to write a salacious book. It kind of worked. But people read this. this. This got out into the public psyche and people were talking. What's going on in that convent over there? What horrible things. And a couple other stories here. The people started clucking so much in Boston and Charlestown that it got to the ears of the selectmen. <clears throat> and some of the citizens demanded that the selectmen go to the convent and demand entry to inspect this convent to see what kinds of nefarious things they're doing. Are they chaining people to the walls? What are they doing? Are there torture chambers in here? We want to know. So a delegation from the selectmen approached the front door of the convent. And in the top window here was the mother superior, Sister Mary St. George. And they demanded entry to the convent. And she was, her real name was Mary Moffat. She was an Irish woman. And she told them in so many words to go take a flying leap. Well, they were incensed. They went to the bishop. Now, the bishop was a politician. And he got word back to Sister Mary St. George, let them in. Don't do that. Let them in. Let them look at the convent. So they gained entry. <clears throat> they interviewed the students. They looked around. And they saw that these girls were happy. They talked to them. No, they weren't being brainwashed into becoming Catholics. No, they weren't being tortured. They, all this stuff was baloney that, that uh, Rebecca Reed had written and what people were talking about in Boston and Charlestown. So they were satisfied that none of it was true. <clears throat> the only problem is they, they didn't announce it. They didn't put it in the paper. They didn't tell anybody. And the clucking kept going on. People kept talking, talking, talking. And then there was another incident. There was a music teacher. She was a nun. And it was, I guess they taught right through the summer in, in this school. And she had had it one day and threw down her baton. And she walked out of school. I can understand that. I'm a teacher. Especially this time of year. I know how she feels. She ended up in the parlor of this old Yankee family complaining about the school and everything. And she, after a while, she calmed down, and Sister Mary and Bishop Fenwick came down and sat down and talked to her. She calmed down, and she agreed to go back. The story on the street was that they dragged her back, screaming and yelling that she didn't want to go back. So things are escalating. People are talking. And then this man comes to town. This is Reverend Lyman Beecher, father of... Harriet Beecher Stowe. <clears throat> now, he was a fire and brimstone Protestant minister, had actually written a book, anti-Catholic book, made three sermons in Boston. In one sermon, he actually advocated burning the cathedral down. This got out there. This is really, this was just the gasoline that was needed, and all they needed was that match. Well, that happened pretty soon. One night, a crowd of about 3,000 people started milling around outside the convent, and they started chanting to let the teacher go, let her out. And it was made up of just workers who had probably been in the local saloons, and it just 
the crowd got bigger and bigger. The next thing you knew, the crowd was at the door of the convent. And they were demanding for her release. And the next thing, they barreled through the door of the front door of the convent. They started to loot the convent. There were pianos going out the windows. They were going through the nuns' clothing, ripping the library apart. This, this was just bedlam. And then somebody lit a match and lit the whole thing on fire. Now, the nuns and the students saw this mob coming, and they went out the back door, and they hid in the garden outside. So they, they got away with their lives. <clears throat> now, the next morning, from Beacon Hill, this is what you could see. The, even the Yankees, the old Beacon Hill Yankees, were appalled. And the governor immediately ordered the, the militia down to stand around and guard that cathedral because he had a feeling that was going to be next. His thinking was right because just a few nights later, the mob gathered again and they made a beeline for the cathedral only to meet the militia. They th decided, let's turn around and they headed to the ruins of the old convent to pick over what was left. They got into the back of the convent where there were actual tombs of nuns that had passed away. They looted the tombs. They actually opened up the mouths of these nuns and pulled out the gold teeth. This was the Boston that Irish came to. That's just one, one of many incidents. And if you want to visit this location, this marker is near the Somerville Library and the actual location of Mount Benedict, as it was called, is about a quarter of a mile towards Boston. Uh, the hill that the convent was on was, as you can see, it was leveled in 1875. But there's a whole neighborhood in there where that hill once stood. And I walked around there and I looked up into the windows and I thought, I wonder how many people actually know what happened right here, just in the 1830s. Probably nobody. There's a little rock down the street. That's all you have, ever hear about it. It's, that's the only remnant of Mount Benedict, Benedict Street. And then there was an incident called the Broad Street Riot. Broad Street was actually the first Irish ghetto. If you're familiar with Boston, Broad Street is the financial district now. And I went there thinking I could find buildings that were from this period, the 1830s. I found out there were a lot of skyscrapers. But I did find buildings that probably witnessed this event I'm about to talk to you. This is one. You can tell by the brickwork how old they are. <clears throat> Here's a story. In, uh, I believe, 1835, uh, there was a group of Irish mourners coming back from a, a wake, an Irish wake. Is the cliche about that true, you think? You go to an Irish wake and there's a lot of drinking. Uh, I don't know. I've never seen that myself. However, they were going down the street, and uh, coming down the street in the opposite direction was a Yankee fire company coming back from a fire. Now, we don't know what happened. Somebody said something to somebody, and a huge brawl broke out right in the middle of the street. And it just it, it grew exponentially. More and more people. Before you knew it, there were thousands of people in the streets. The buildings were being torn open. There was looting, rampant looting, fighting. People were grabbing whatever they could get, a branch, a brick off the street, and just battering each other. And this happened, if you can imagine what it looked like. I had a friend of mine do this painting for me. This, this is probably a lot what it looked like. And this went on for a couple days. And, you know, ironically, oddly enough, nobody was killed in this riot. Many people were arrested. The only people to go to jail were Irish people. So this brings us to the Great Famine. Here's another one. Here's another one. My public education, uh, and I'm a public school teacher, and I'm not in public education. <laughs> uh, my, my knowledge of the potato famine was, oh, wow, there was a, <clears throat> a great blight that wiped out the potato crop in, in um, Ireland, and people began to starve. So I thought, um, wasn't there other food? Is that all they ate, potatoes? Well... To tell you the truth, there was other food. And these people were tenant farmers. And they were growing food for the English that was being exported. 
while people were starving. Uh, they lived on the land of their ancestors that was now English in these little cutout hovels. It's uh, a drawing from the time period. And they had these little yards in their little cabin and they had to grow something in that little enclosure that they could survive on for a year. Potatoes were the perfect crop. You plant a little patch of potatoes and that'll last you for the entire year until it goes bad, until a, a, a fungus kills them for three to four years. Then you don't have anything to eat. And that's why they started to starve. Now at first, the uh, British government was responsive. The uh, Prime Minister was Sir Robert Peel. They started to institute soup kitchens. They started to uh, have workhouses, things that would help the Irish. It still, it still wasn't working enough. There were people still starving to death. And then this government was replaced with another government that was more conservative, I guess you could say. They were uh, what they called back then laissez-faire, which means let it happen. This government actually said it was the, it was the Irish, it was their own fault. So let whatever's going to happen, happen. And they pulled back on the, the soup kitchens, they pulled back on the aid, and people began to die in the thousands, in the hundreds of thousands. It was, it's, a, it's a crime, it's a blot on the uh, name of the British Empire. They passed something called the Poor Law. They, they wiped their hands, the British Parliament said, let the landlords take care of it, the, the absentee English landlords. And they did. The way they took care of it was if you were starving and couldn't get to work, you're, you're going to be evicted from your house because you can't pay for your rent. And thousands of people were just kicked out of their houses and thrown out into the street, out into the woods, and they had to survive on whatever they could find. And these are actual drawings from life. There were reporters from Great Britain on the scene telling the story of this. The whole world knew about it. Meanwhile, crops are being exported out of Ireland. There was a big argument over, let's get corn from American brand here. And that they, I think they actually did make a shipment. By the time it got here, it was rotten. But they were exporting food while this is all going on. If you look at these figures, it, it's so sad. These were drawn from life. People back in England watched this. We knew about it here. In fact, you've got to give the old Yankees credit. They filled a ship full of food and sent it over there to try to help. Meanwhile, people are scavenging for food. This really brings it into focus. If you look at this drawing um, very closely, this woman, is she dead? That baby suckling on her, is she suckling on a dead woman? The child next to her, to her right, is eating shoe leather. The husband's outside trying to peel bark off the tree to eat that. They're literally starving to death with no help. Babies, mothers. I came across a story of a, an American traveler who was traveling through Ireland at this time. And he was uh, being taken through, uh, I believe, Southern Ireland with uh, a, a gentleman who was Irish on a cart. And it was, the devastation was so bad that there were bodies just laying on the side of the road. And he, he remarked to his host, he said, all these bodies, they, they have, their mouths are all green. Why is that? And, and his response was, oh, they've been eating the grass. You can't live on grass, you know. This was the condition of Ireland. Something had to be done because people were just dry, dying in droves. nearly a third of the population either died or emigrated someplace. And that's where a lot of people ended up doing, the, a lot of landlords just decided to pack up their people and send them to America. Some people went to South America. Uh, and this is the condition on, in which they got on these ships. Many people were sick. They had any disease you can name. 
and they got on these ships in this condition. This, this is a statue in Dublin. This is how they got on the ships. Can you imagine what they looked like when they got off the ships? And these are the ships that they were transported here on. Maybe you've heard what they referred to them as, coffin ships. And they certainly were coffin ships. They were cargo ships that were filled to the brim. This is how you could afford it. And in the age of steam, they were still sending people over on sailing ships. That looks pleasant. I see this, and I, it recall my, I recall my days of teaching about the middle passage. This was the slave passage, where they would do the tight pack and the loose pack, and how, what a torturous journey that was. And I look at this and I think, oh, that kind of reminds me of that a little bit. And I recall that every day those slaves would be taken out in the morning and the bodies would be thrown over the side of the ships. And even today, there's a long history of sharks following that same route through the uh, southern Atlantic because they're still looking for bodies. And the situation wasn't too much different in the northern Atlantic with the Irish. Every morning... They'd take those bodies and throw them over the edge. A lot of people never made it. But when they saw that first sign of shore, you can, can you imagine the elation in their hearts? They had heard those stories. The streets are paved in gold. This is America. We're here. And this is what they found. Slums. The people that came to New York... This is actually a, a lithograph of what New York looked like. Most of the Irish ended up in New York. They ended up in an area called the Five Points, which is now Chinatown, Little Italy. And it was teeming with people. Uh, Charles Dickens took a tour of this. He was slumming, so to say. And he remarked that this was the worst place on the planet. It was worse than Calcutta. Just the... the the thousands of Irish that came in. And Boston probably wasn't much different. And you can imagine, this is what they looked like when they got off those ships. This is the statue in Boston, the Irish Famine Memorial. You see this emaciated, disease-ridden family. And this is how they got here. And I love the statue because it's not just one statue, there's two. And I like to think... At least my interpretation is this is the modern Irish family. And what they should do is they should remember and look back where they came from. Another interpretation might be that this is the same family a few years later. But look at that. This is how the Irish came to Boston in the 1840s. Now, when they got here... Uh, there, wasn't, uh, there wasn't much for housing. Uh, I believe in 1847 alone, 37,000 Irish came to Boston. Can you, even today, could you imagine? That is a tidal wave, and there was nowhere to put them. These are the types of houses that they lived in. Here's some accounts here. They settled in the areas of Boston, the Boston waterfront, what was known as the Battery March, Broad Street. The North End was an Irish ghetto. In East Boston, they hadn't gotten to Southie yet. This is where they first came. And this is what Boston looked like. This is the first aerial photograph of Boston. It was mainly wooden tenement buildings. And they were crowded... Into, into anywhere they could shove them, sheds, stables, low ceiling garrets, uh, basements, cellars. Uh, some of the most horrible, uh, unsanitary uh, conditions imaginable. Now, I have some facts here that I wanted to read to you. This, is, this just gives you a little snippet in time here. One survey showed that there were 67 toilets in 118 houses inhabited by 540 immigrants. 17 of those were out of order. This is in a tenement block. One sink might serve a whole stinking tenement building. 
In some cases, one outhouse might serve an entire neighborhood. And these people came in with diseases and they came here and they continued to die. I've read accounts of the police being called and just taking dead bodies out on a regular basis. This was Boston. This is the city that they came to. Now, when we go walking through places like the North End, next time you go to the North End for a nice Italian dinner, take a look down an alley like this. This is what I do. I tell my wife, I always say, I always look at what was there. I don't care about what this, what's there now. Uh, back in these days, you might see this scene. Women doing their wash, kids running around. These, these buildings now that go for uh, mucho dinero uh, were squalid tenement buildings. A lot of the buildings you see in the north end right now probably weren't there. There were wooden buildings in their place, tenement buildings like I just described here. And you can imagine the squalid conditions that they lived in, in these neighborhoods. A lot of the buildings, if you look on the, uh, <clears throat> the cornice boards, they have Irish names on them. Can you imagine Hanover Street looking like that? Yeah. This little street with all these nice, uh, nice cars probably looked like that. Yeah. It was tough, but it was better than dying. And what did they have to work? These are the working conditions they came into. If you were a woman, you really didn't have a lot of choice. You could be what they call the domestic that was a, a maid, where you probably would work up on Beacon Hill for the, the old Yankees, um, making their beds, doing their laundry, whatnot. Or you could be, as this woman here, is a scrubber woman. You spent your days on your hands and knees with a scrubbing brush, cleaning floors. It was a very nice job, very rewarding. That's what you had. That was your choice if you were a lady. Now, men, men had much more. They had more, much more opportunities. You could be a waiter. Um, there was one area that you couldn't work in. Uh, you could not be a barber because, believe it or not, uh, my studies uncovered that the African Americans had the corner on the barber market for some reason. Uh, and here's a picture here of that. Or you could work in a grocery store. This is the equivalent of 7-Eleven, I guess. These are the jobs that were open to the Irish because they were farmers. They didn't know how to do anything in the city. Or you could work in one of those squalid factories, the ones that didn't have the Nina sign up, no Irish need apply, and you could work six to seven days a week, uh, 14 hours a day in, in uh, horrible hot conditions in the summer, horrible cold conditions in the winter, and you did what they call piecework. That meant you were paid according to the amount you put out. So these people stood by their machines all day. They ate by their machines, they smoked their cigarettes next to the machines, and they never left. So they could make enough to feed their kids. Those were the good jobs. And they worked in a city that looked like this. This is before the EPA. Yeah, with all those factories belching smoke into the air. Or you could be a stevedore or a longshoreman. Everything that was put on and off of those ships was on the back of an Irishman. Not like today where they have these big cranes and containers and all that stuff. And this is what the, what the waterfront looked like at that time. <clears throat> it's gotten a little bit bigger. That's what it looks like now. Or you could be the quintessential ditch digger. They called them muck legs. They called them blackguards, ditch diggers, muckrakers. And these were hard jobs. You had to be a physically strong man to do it. And a lot of these guys that came over and worked on these jobs dropped dead before the age of 50. But it was a whole lot better than starving to death. And you could literally say the Irish built Boston. 
It started in the 1820s. They leveled Beacon Hill and they leveled it to fill in the marshy areas of Boston. This, this graphic shows it all. This is what the Puritans had and this is what the Irish made it into. By 1830, the Mill Pond area was filled in. This was from Beacon Hill, <coughs> all with Irish labor. Uh, the South Cove and the Great Cove were filled in. If you ever go to Chinatown, you think you're in the middle of the city, and then you see a street that says Beach Street. That's because it went to the beach at one time. The West Cove. <coughs> and eventually, the area we know as the Back Bay. It's called the Back Bay because it was the Back Bay. It was a big old marsh up until the 1890s. They did have steam shovels by that time, so it wasn't just back-breaking labor to do that. This was mainly done by Irish labor. And then after this flood of humanity into Boston, we started to see a backlash. Now, it came in the form of a political party. A new political party came on the scene. <coughs> and if you look at this, they were called the Know Nothing Party. Pardon me. Uh, at first, they were just kind of a secretive club, and they were called the Know Nothing because if anybody said, So, what are you doing in there? They were told to reply, I know nothing. Just like Sergeant Schultz, I know nothing. Um, and it, it's kind of frustrating for historians, too, because they were so secretive, they never kept minutes of their meeting or anything. But they became a major political party for a flash moment in the mid-1800s, 1840s and 50s. And they were called the American Nativist Party. Now, they were against Irish immigration. They were against any foreign influence in America. And... Uh, they were also, you know, the odd thing was a wing of the party were abolitionists. They were against slavery. And it, this, this party disintegrated after about five to seven years, just splintered. That abolitionist wing morphed into what we know as the Republican Party. Now, to give you an idea, in, in Boston... This party, this party swept into office. This is amazing. We've ne never seen anything like this since. In the election of 1854, they swept the, uh, every state constitutional office, including governor. They won all 40 state Senate races. They carried every U.S. constitutional district. Out of 381 seats up for election in the state house of reps, they won 379. That is amazing. And they elected their first know-nothing governor. Now, he was the only know-nothing governor. Is that surprising? I think we've had a few others, but not from this party. <laughs> his name was Henry J. Gardner, and his, his platform was anti-Irish Catholic. He wanted to get the Irish Catholics out of Boston, out of Massachusetts. Here was their agenda. Their platform was that they would be they would ban any kind of reading of any Bible except for the King James Bible. They banned the teaching of any foreign language in schools. They disbanded the Irish militia units. They proposed a constitutional amendment that would forbid Roman Catholics from holding office in Massachusetts. It failed, luckily. Under the Pauper Removal Act that they had, they had 1,300 Irish paupers were collected and sent back to Ireland. They also formed something called the Joint Legislative Committee on the Inspection of Nunneries and Convents. I guess they thought there were some nefarious, horrible things going on in the convents. I believe here's a cartoon showing this. Here is the, the Committee on the Inspection of Convents. Oh, what have they found here? A cross. Do you know what that is? We're not old enough to know what they are, are we? That is a chamber pot, a potty. Uh, back then, they called them thunder jugs. So I wonder what they were keeping in there. This is, this is the state of the know-nothings. The whole country was like this. This attitude towards any kind of immigrants, specifically Irish, 
was rampant in America. You could just open a newspaper, any newspaper anywhere in the country, and see this bigotry open. Here we are. Here, the poorhouse from Galway is coming across. Let's send it back. Yeah. This one you have to look at a little closely. Those aren't alligators or crocodiles. Those are bishops in mitre hats from Rome invading America. Look at these poor Native Americans. Yes, it's an invasion. And here, here's a nice depiction of an Irish gentleman, a Fenian. That's actually a, a very um, nice, it is, compared to what I'm going to show you. This, this is how people depicted the Irish. It was more often like this. They were ape-like. Everyone you see, every one of these things, they look like apes. They were considered drunks. They were considered brawlers. Does this sound familiar? Fighting Irish. Uh, they were considered ne'er-do-wells that did nothing but sit around all day and drink. Uh, here's another one. Brawling Irishmen. All these stereotypes come out of this time. Some of them still exist. Oh, and what if they get involved in politics? Do you know who's going to be telling them what to do? The Pope is going to be telling them. I, I think people were saying that up to 1960. Maybe. These were attitudes. Oh, and there was another group that Americans didn't really like too much either. The Chinese. And this was a, a, a solution to the Irish-Chinese problem. Oh, boy. Imagine something like this in the, in the newspapers today. Um, I like this one, too. Who would you like as your nurse? Florence Nightingale or Bridget McBroser? <laughs> and, of course, here we go. Lady Liberty grabbing this dirty Irishman by the neck. Throw him back. This was the tenor of the times. This was the attitude towards the Irish. And after a while, the Irish had had enough. They started to organize politically and started to take power. It started in Boston with this gentleman right here. This is Patrick McGuire, first generation Irish, self-educated. He started something called the Young Men's Democratic Club. It was a political club. And it was kind of the template for all the little ward bosses and clubs all around Boston. Uh, they started to get together, and, and the thinking was, let's get our people into positions of power in Boston. The first positions were things like dog catcher, lamp lighter. Uh, then, then you started to see some Irish get on the city council. And then pretty soon, we had our first Irish Catholic mayor. His name was Hugh O'Brien. Now, this was done, I call this the age of cooperation, because this was done in conjunction with some more liberal Yankees of the time. And they considered Hugh O'Brien a clean Irishman. He looks like a businessman. He's a clean Irishman. And he got in there, and he was actually a very good mayor, believe it or not. And the second Irish Catholic mayor in Boston was Pat Collins. He served from 1902 to 1905. Now, as I said, this began uh, the ward boss era of Boston. Each neighborhood had their own ward boss. And the most famous, strongest of them all was Martin Lemansney over in the East End, which is no more. Uh, it's a bunch of big, tall buildings now. But when it was in its heyday, he had a place called the Hendricks Club over there. And if you had a problem, if you were Irish and you were off the boat from Ireland or you had a problem getting a house or a job, you went to Martin Lemansney and he'd fix you up. Even if you just needed food, he would fix you up. You need a job, he'd take care of you. And he asked one thing. I hear it. Your vote. That's all you had to do. If he said vote for candidate X, that whole neighborhood in an unmas would vote for that candidate. He had so much power. And here are some of his protégés. This is a young man from North Boston, the North End. Uh, he eventually became the ward boss of the North End. And his name was Johnny Fitz.
Fitz. <clears throat> you may know him as Honey Fitz. Uh, the way he got Honey Fitz was there was a reporter that was listening in to people talking to him, and they, he overheard Honey Fitz when they were calling him Johnny Fitz, and he printed it out, Honey Fitz, and the name stuck. He was one of Lemansney's protégés. He learned at the knee of Martin Lemansney. Also, there was another fellow over in East Boston. His name was P.J. Kennedy. He owned a few saloons over there, and he started to get into politics as well. And there was a young upstart over in the south end of Boston, not South Boston, but Roxbury South End. His name was James Michael Curley. These men all studied at, at the foot or the knee of Martin Lemansney. Let me tell you about some of these fellows. Old Honey Fitz. This is uh, him. He became the ward boss of the North End, and he was just this ball of energy. He was, he was just a small guy. He was like, uh, one book I read called him a, a little pixie. He'd be all over the place. Had so much energy. His father died at a young age. He had to take care of his family. And he got involved in every club and everything in the North End and eventually became the, the ward boss of the North End. He would see his constituents on the street and they'd know him and he'd say, My dear Rose! That was his nickname for his people. My dear Rose! And he lived right here. This is Four Garden Court. If you ever go to the Paul Revere House, take a left. It's a little alleyway. This is where Rose Kennedy was born. Rose Fitzgerald Kennedy. And what do we think of when the Kennedys? We think of Hyannis and Palm Beach. This is where they started, here, in this tenement building, which looks like it hasn't been painted since. It's under private ownership. So he became the ward boss over there. And then there was P.J. Kennedy. This is a picture taken much later. And he was in operation over in East Boston. And the saloon is where all the politics happen. This is where people talk. This is where people do deals. And he did a lot of favors for people. He served as a state representative. And he was very powerful over in East Boston. And he became good friends with Honey Fitz. And you know the rest of the story, right? Let me show you a few people. This is uh, young Joseph Kennedy. This is young Rose Kennedy. The clan used to, uh, I guess, vacation up on Old Orchard Beach in Maine. This is where that was taken. This is another one. This is him in old age with his grandson to the left. You may recognize him. And then there was old James Michael Curley. Now, Curley, a lot like Honey Fitz, uh, it was him his brother and his mother, his, his, his father was a uh, laborer, big man. And uh, one day on the job, they were working and some of the guys said, hey, I bet you can't pick up that big rock over there. And Curly's father went over and he picked up the rock and he had a brain aneurysm killed over dead. So now James Michael is now the man of the family. He had to take care of his mother, who was a washerwoman, and his brother. He left school became a drug clerk, somebody that just ran errands for the drugstore. And one day, one of his customers said, boy, you got the gift of gab. Why don't you be a politician? And he took the advice. He eventually rose to the level of uh, city councilman. <clears throat> and he too, he lived over on uh, Northampton Street. If you uh, know where Northampton Street is, that's near City Hospital, or what they call it, BU Medical Center now right next to that building there. So you can imagine his building probably looked a lot like that before they tore it down. And he would read Shakespeare. He would sit in the window and read Shakespeare. He was uh, very eloquent, very loquacious. He could talk. He could captivate an audience with his speaking. And he sure, he sure knew how to speak. He had his own political club. And it was called, of all things, it was called the um, Tammany Club. What a crazy name. If you know anything about the Tammany Hall in New York, that's what it looked like. He was, uh, it was still in, uh, at the time in the 30s when Al Smith was running. And I found the location. It's over in the south end of Boston. And this is what it looks like today. I don't think that's the building. Maybe the foundation, but you can see those two little blocks. <clears throat> now, James Michael Curley ran into a little trouble early on. He was another one of these ward bosses that would do anything for you. 
And he had this one constituent who came up to him and said, Oh, James Michael, I took the postal exam and I flunked it. And he said, why did, why did, you, why did you flunk? I couldn't spell the word Constantinople. And Curly said, we'll fix that for you. What he did was, the next time the exam came up, he went and took the exam masquerading as this postal employee, future postal employee, hopefully. And he was caught. City councilman caught fraudulently taking an exam. You would think you would never hear of this man ever again. This was a big scandal. He was thrown in jail. But he got out. And this man was mayor of Boston four times. He was governor of Massachusetts. He was a congressman. And every time he ran for office, people would say, weren't you arrested for fraud? And he would say the same thing over and over again. He'd say, I did it for a friend. And that cemented his reputation with people. They knew that he was willing to stick out his neck for his own people. And they voted for him again and again and again. There's more on him. Well, Mayor Collins died midway through his term in office. Poor Mayor Collins. Martin Lemansky had somebody all lined up, ready to go. Somebody to be Mayor of Boston. Young... Johnny Fitz, that upstart from the North End, went against his mentor and ran for mayor against Lemansney's man. He ran against the machine, so to say. Got himself elected third mayor of Boston. And here he is, the third mayor of Boston. He had his own political club over on Chandler Street. It was called the Jefferson Club. That's the building. It's still there today. Now, he ran on a platform of making Boston bigger, better, and busier. This is his actual campaign poster. And he did that. He brought business into Boston. He did make Boston bigger. He brought it into the 20th century, you might say. But that old ward politics thing followed him. People were still asking favors. There were people on his doorstep. And the old Yankees that he used to work with were now his enemies. They formed a, a group called the Good Government Club, and they went against him. They said there was graft, nepotism, all these horrible things. By the way, Curley would later call them the Goo Goos. Uh, and he was voted out of office the next time. But he did run again and served two terms as mayor. He loved it. He loved being mayor in the city hall, the beautiful city hall of Boston, which is still there today. Thank God they wanted to tear this thing down in the 50s. Did you know that? They, and you know what they replaced it with, right? That monstrosity, that upside down cake. Ugh. Ooh. They called it urban renewal. And there he is, Honey Fitz. He loved the people. He would, he would go into bars and he would sing Sweet Adeline. And most people would think, oh, what a drunk he was. He was a teetotaler. He didn't drink a drop of whiskey, but he loved singing in bar rooms. And what, what a happy Irishman he was. He, look at him at the baseball game. He was the first Irish mayor, to, the first mayor of Boston to even fly in a plane. He got in a plane over in Squantum Air Base, a, a biplane. First guy to get up there. He only served two terms. He retired down in Palm Beach. Here you see him with JFK and Joe Kennedy. And I found a story that came down to us from Ted Kennedy. He said in, in those days when he was retired, he'd sit down in the lobby of a hotel in Palm Beach. And he'd sit by the, the check-in desk, you know, with the little bell, keeping his ear out. And every time he'd hear somebody say, oh, I'm from Boston, he would pop out of his seat and say, my dearos! And he'd get a free lunch and give them the tour of Palm Beach all in one day. So that, that was Honey Fitz, this pixie of energy. And I think JFK probably got his sense of humor from him. And here's his, his gravestone. Um... Mount Calvary in uh, Rosendale is his last resting place. And there was another memorial to him. Maybe some of you remember driving over it. 
the John Fitzgerald Highway. How many, I'm, I'm not even that old, and I, I well, I'm, yeah, I'm getting there. I remember sitting on that thing, staring at the tower there for a long time. I don't think traffic's changed even though we got rid of it. It's still bad. Remember that tunnel was supposed to solve all of our traffic problems. Yeah, right, okay. Now we know uh, this area is now the Rose Kennedy Greenway. Beautiful area. Yeah. So we're nearing the end, folks, here. The mayoral race of 1913 pitted James Michael Curley against Honey Fitz. Honey Fitz was running one last time, hoping that he could get, grasp mayor for a third time. Now, what happened was, in the early polls, the straw polls, Honey Fitz was actually leading Curly by a wide margin. Something happened to stop that, though. Now, Honey Fitz, as I said, he was a ball of energy, and he would go to every, every activity in town, especially during election season. He was just a ball of energy. And uh, he, would, he would do things like he would show up at people's wakes and glad hand everybody and say hi and everything. And then he'd go out the door and, and the widow would be going, I didn't know my husband knew him. He would just go to every little function. At the end of every day, though, he had to relax. He would end up in a roadhouse on the outskirts of Boston, uh, probably do a, a refrain of Sweet Adeline for the crowd. And uh, oftentimes he would have a little dance with a cigarette girl by the name of Toodles. Toodles Ryan was her name. Mm -hmm. One night, whilst dancing, he kissed her on the cheek. Thing was, one of Curly's operatives was sitting there and witnessed this act, this disgusting act. Before you knew it, Back at, back at home, Mrs. Mrs. Fitzgerald received a nice black-bordered letter which outlined the whole horrible activity that he actually kissed this woman, Toodles Ryan, in public in this, in this horrible bar room. It probably made it seem like it was a lot worse than it really was. And uh, Honey Fitz came home, and there's his wife sitting on the stairs with that letter. With real Ricky Ricardo moment, you've got some splaining to do, mister. And he must, have, he must have really had the gift of gab. I'm sure he kissed that Blarney Stone a few times because he talked his way out of it. And he explained that there's nothing to it. It was just a peck on the cheek, and I'm not going to drop out of the race. This is blackmail, and I know who's behind it. It's that Curly. Well, this went on for about a week, and you can imagine Curly. He's, he's reading the papers waiting for that announcement that he's going to drop out because he doesn't want this getting out, this horrible affair with toodles. So Curly goes to plan B. He decides that he's going to advertise two lectures that he is doing in the future. The first lecture would be Great Lovers in History, Cleopatra to Toodles. <laughs> the next lecture would be Great Libertines in History, Henry VIII till Present. At this, Honey Fitz saw the writing on the wall. He saw his name was going to be smeared all over the place, and he dropped out. And James Michael Curley became the fourth mayor of Boston, Irish Catholic mayor of Boston, by default. And I love this picture of him because it shows Curley. This is Curley, that little velvet glove there. He was a tough guy. He played hardball. They call him probably the first of the modern politicians. Now, Curly was funny. You either hated him or you loved him. And as I read about him, at different times I'd say, what a wonderful man. Then at other times I'd go, what a horrible guy. And it, it's just this dichotomy, this, this uh, two Curlies. So I'm going to call this, I call this the, the good, the bad, the Curly. I'll tell you the good first. Are you ready for the good? James Michael Curly. When he first took office, when he first moved into the city hall as mayor, he made his first executive order was to give the washerwoman, the scrub women, mops. What that? And you're probably thinking, oh, what's that? He said, 
his mother was a struggle woman. He said that no woman should be on her knees unless she's praying to God. He gave those women dignity. He did that um, when, he, when he was a city councilman. He provided meals. He provided jobs for people. Um, here's another story that I came across. And this came out years after he died. His, his driver, who would usually uh, be waiting out of City Hall, waiting for Curly to come out after uh, a long day's work. He'd usually come out of work about 10 o'clock. Um, nobody was there. There weren't any cameras. There weren't any TV personalities. Well, they didn't have TV back then. Uh, this was just known to this one person. And this would often happen. There would be this drunk named Mike. And Mike would usually be outside of City Hall just kind of sitting around and then James Michael Curley would come out and he'd kind of walk over to him. And Curley oftentimes would walk up to him with a bill in his hand and shake him and say, Mike, here you go, here's the money I owe There were no cameras there, nobody knew this. That was James Michael Curley. Um, that's the good Curley. People loved him. I, I had a fellow come up to me and he said, one time... Curly came up to us, and he bought ice cream for all us boys. I love Curly. So that was James Michael Curly. That's the good Curly. Now, there was also the bad Curly. And this personifies the bad Curly. This is the mansion he bought his first year as mayor. And even then, he couldn't afford it by a long shot. It's still there on the Jamaica Way. It's owned by the city of Boston now. <clears throat> when he was confronted with this, reporters said, how did you afford this? And he said, well, I have a, a business interest. I have invested with this plumber, and uh, I have this side thing going with him. And the plumber's name, of all things, was Daly. And this is where I got all my money. <laughs> the truth was he got his money from bribery, graft, corruption. And there's no, two, there's no doubt about it. Uh, I came across another story where there was a, a fellow that was a roofer. And he went to Curly because he just wanted a job. He thought he could give him a, a job doing something. He came to Curly and said, I'm a roofer. You got anything for me? And Curly said, yeah, there's a school over in GAP and uh, it needs a roof replaced. Now, it's, it's worth this, but I want you to put in a high bid, and you know what you're going to do with the um, excess. It's going to go in my pocket, in so many words. So the man went up to the school. He climbed up the ladder and looked on the roof. It was perfect. There was nothing wrong with it. So he went back to Curly, and he said, hey, I think you gave me the wrong school, because that, that school's roof, there's nothing wrong with it. Curly said, sure there is. Go up there and make like you're doing something. Come back down, and we'll pay you. That was the bad James Michael Curley. It said that he had two safes full of cash from all this corruption. And many times, the press would assail him for being corrupt, and what he'd do is just sue him, and they'd go away. Now, there, there was this one editor, his name was Enright, who would not go away. He kept assailing him in the paper, saying he was corrupt, that he was uh, taking bribes, everything. And one day, Enright was walking down Washington Street, and across the way, he sees James Michael Curley, and they're, they're about to pass each other, and he thought maybe he might get a dirty look or something. Curley walks up to him, and he punches him right in the jaw, right in the middle of the street. This man, in his memoir, he said he woke up, came to, and Curley was leaning over, swearing his head off at him. Can you imagine Marty Mann doing this? <laughs> or Peter Mann? He had a violent side to him. One time, there was a political opponent, or a, a surrogate for a political opponent, on WBZ radio, bad-mouthing Curly before an election. The thing he didn't know was Curly was the next guest. Curly went into the booth on the air and pummeled the man. And he continued to get elected. The thing is, I think the people of Boston got wise to him because he would get elected. And then he'd lose the election, and then 10 years later, he'd get elected again. So he was le elected in the teens, the 20s, the 30s, and 40s. It's like they'd forget what he was about, then they'd elect him, and oh yeah, this is Curly. So there were a lot, I, can, I have a whole list of bad things that I'm not going to bore you with. But uh, in the end, 
Curley had, uh, he'd run through the 30s. Here he is, I think, in the 20s. Yeah, he's got that raccoon coat on. Here he is during the FDR times. And uh, the fourth time he was mayor, he ran into a little bit of trouble. As you can see, he's starting to get a little gray. He was starting to think about, what am I going to do for retirement? So I've got these two safes full of money. I should invest. And he found the perfect investment opportunity. He found out in Nevada, there was this group that had a silver mine. They flew him out there, and they showed him the silver mine. What he didn't know was they dug this tunnel in the dirt, and they took silver and stuck it in the dirt. And they took him through the tunnel. Look at all the silver. He thought this was a mammoth investment. That he was going to make tons of money. Put all of his money into it. They made him the president of the company. The next thing he knows, he's getting a subpoena because these same men are down in Washington, D.C., bribing people in his name to do things for them. He got convicted in a federal court of law and sent down to Danbury Federal Penitentiary. And he's still the mayor of Boston in a federal penitentiary. Now, I'll have you know that every, every politician in New England, save one, signed a petition to get him out early. Can you guess who that one was? It was in the oh late 1950s. He was a young congressman, former PT boat captain. Yeah, John F. Kennedy would not sign that. And this is called karma, I think. Uh, finally, he got out of prison, uh, finished out his term, and then he tried to run for a fifth time. Uh, I think, hopefully this is the slide. No, this is in the 40s. This one, when he's running for office his fifth time, he got number five license plate. And there's, there's a whole shady story attached to that, too. I won't get into that. But he, he didn't get elected. He's broke. Additionally, uh, he had, I think he had nine kids. Several of his kids died. I think two of his kids died the same day. He actually confided that he thought it was God punishing him for all of his acts of, of dishonesty. And he, he became this really sad character hanging around the state house. Um, oh, oh, gave it away. Hanging around the state house uh, looking for odd jobs from politicians. I, I came across this story. Young Tip O'Neill, he was a congressman, said that Curley approached him and said, oh, Tip, is there anything I can do to earn some extra money? And Tip knew his situation, he knew he was broke, and he said, sure, um, can you raise some funds for me? Do you think you can get some political donors for me? Oh, sure, I can do that. Next thing, a few months later, some of his political donors are coming in and saying, I thought I gave you 20000 Where's the rest? <laughs> Old Curly was back. <laughs> um, he, I think he would have went into oblivion, and we would never know much about him otherwise. But uh, just at the end of his, his existence, something happened. You already saw it. There was a book written called The Last Hurrah. It was a fictional account of a Mayor Skeffington. But everybody who read it knew it was 100% Curley. It was the biography of James Michael Curley. Edwin O'Connor was a local writer. And he feared running into Curly because he knew, obviously, this is Curly's life. And one day he was getting out of his car in front of the state house, and who was walking down the sidewalk but James Michael Curly? And as he approached Curly, he's thinking of the other. Curly walks up to him and he grabs his hand and he shakes it and goes, I love the book. I love it, especially the part where I die. <laughs> and he started going on lecture tours as Mayor Skeffington. Raking in the cash. Eventually, this book was made into a movie with Spencer Tracy. Yeah, I heard you. Spencer Tracy, another Irishman. That's how he went out. James Michael Curley. Here's his gravestone. It's at St. Joseph's Cemetery in Boston. I know that's a bad picture. Here's a close-up. Um... 
if you read it, looks like his resume, doesn't it? Yeah. Governor of Massachusetts, Mayor of Boston, Congress. And I think, I think the title that he most appreciated was the Mayor of the Poor. Yeah. Now, when he died, when he finally went, they laid him in state in the rotunda in the state house. And from what I've heard, there were lines up and down Beacon Street, people coming to see James Michael Curley. I've talked to people that were in the lines. A lot of people loved him. A lot of people hated him. So, if you want to visit James Michael Curley, he's still around. If you go down to Faneuil Hall, you can either sit down and have a chat with him or rub his belly. Uh, <laughs> every year I take my eighth graders down. And they sit on his lap and they rub his belly and his head. And I'll say, do you know who that is? And they'll say, nope, because they're too busy looking at their phone. And I'll say, take that phone and Google James Michael Curley. You'll learn something today. That was a great man. So in conclusion, these people, the Irish, they came to our shores. And they endured ethnic and religious bigotry. They endured squalid, wretched, cramped living conditions. They endured backbreaking, menial labor. But in the end, in the end, they persevered, they overcame, and they prevailed. Thank you for coming out tonight.